I'm Arie Schwartz, along with my co-host, Rachel Galligan, and welcome to the WNBA Insider Show. Each week, we cover different topics important to the W, using X's and O's, along with key stats to bring honest and critical analysis. Uh, this is going to be a bright spot in our, in our series, and excuse the bad pun. We're going to be focusing on the Connecticut Sun, the top team uh, in the league currently. We'll be starting with their game uh, that will be on the 13th. So that's tomorrow night as of our recording, but probably the same day of the release, where the Connecticut Sun will be taking on the Mystics at home. Rachel, what are your thoughts? I mean, last game was over 20 points, blowout a couple Sundays ago. What can the Mystics do to kind of turn that around? Tomorrow, um, as opposed to what we saw back on the third. Um, You know, we're... Basically, you know, the, the Mystics had a really tough stretch there um, for a lot of different reasons. They went on the road um, and, and had to had a really tough stretch out west uh, where they were battling some injuries, some illnesses, uh, some, some things going on with the team where, you know, they, they weren't complete. Um, they've they've kind of gotten back and tried to regroup a little bit, but but had a lot of quick turnarounds. I mean, we're looking at a series of, you know, four games in, in like a week, uh, which, which is very, very tough on on anybody. Um, and not to mention being without, you know, their all-star Elena Deladon, who, who has since returned, which, which is, uh, you know, great news. We'd love to hear that, but, you know, being on this, uh, this three game skid, I think, I think we're going to see the, the first part to it is, you know, they, they've been able to have a week to kind of rest and regroup, uh, kind of get themselves together, maybe not a complete week, but some time to kind of get get healthy again. They weren't 100% when they faced the Sun the first time. They were they were beat up from the road, um, like, like I was talking about the the injuries and those things plagued them. The Sun came out hot. You know they they shot uh, 47% from the field as opposed to you know the Mystics. You know only shot 14% from the three point line, and that's an area of their game that they live and die by. So they were really kind of able to jump out on them early. Um, there really wasn't um, much of a chance kind of from that point on. It was, you know, that 24-point victory was, they weren't going to overcome that um, in their current state. And so I think you're looking at a Mystics team that's, that's kind of been able to regroup, um, bounce back. Uh, matchups have looked different. The Sun have, have uh, you know, gone, gone bigger and switched up some things in their lineup. And, I mean, let's be honest, you get Elena Deladon back in the lineup. Um, she's back to kind of feeling hopefully close to hundred percent after her, the last game. And, and I mean, that's, that's a huge small, um, piece of the puzzle right there that, that you can't deny. So I think we're going to see a healthy mystics team, uh, versus obviously an extremely dominant sun team. And, and let's, let's not be, let's not kid ourselves. This is a powerhouse matchup between these two. You know, the mystics started out four and zero. they were just as hot as the sun were to start the season and, uh, just kind of hit, hit, you know, some, some road bumps there, but we've seen what this team is capable of doing. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they come out and are clicking on all cylinders tomorrow. It's going to be an interesting game. I mean, they finally get some rest, like kind of what you touched on. They haven't had much rest at all this season, but no matter how good they are, look who they're going up against. I mean, this is an intimidating Connecticut Sun team. What is a coach? I want, I want you to put your coach hat on right now. Is it is it as simple as saying we got whomped by them before? Let's come out aggressive and let's come out on point. Or you know, what's the mindset of a coach coming into a, a rematch after being blown out? Well, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I think de- defensively, you've got to try to find a way to at least slow down their offensive production to some degree. I mean, these are two offensively minded teams. I mean, from a standpoint of their ability to put points on the board. Um, the Connecticut Sun. I mean, they've they've proven they've scored over 103 games so far this year, um, and they've got six players um, averaging double figures. I mean, so so we're not talking about a team that has um, just kind of that alpha dog type of player. This is a team that's like, you know, a four, five, six headed monster, um, and that's very difficult for a coach to defend. Um, to, to kind of scheme against because they can play so many ways. Uh, Kurt Miller is, is brilliant in the way he he's coaching his team right now and how versatile they can be switching up lineups, going small, going big. And, um, and, and so it, it's going to take a great effort by the mystics, just like it's going to take a great effort by everybody. You, you got, you got to hope that you have a little bit of luck too. Um, you got to hope that they're missing some shots. 
um, the mystics have got to hit some shots. You know, they, they live and die so much by getting out in transition and being able to take quick shots in the shot clock. And, and if they're shooting, just like Crystal Thomas had mentioned on, um, our podcast a few weeks ago, you know, when, when they're shooting in the teens or even in the low twenties, uh, that that's when they struggle and that's when they have not been able to outlast games. And so it, you know, to me, the biggest, the biggest keys for the game for the mystics are going to be, um, you've, you've got to somehow, uh, match up with them on the boards. Connecticut leads the league in rebounding. And if they're having their way on the offensive glass, um, it, it's going to be a long night. So you've got to control the boards. You've got to, you've got to at least somewhat keep that close. You can't let them dominate you on the boards. Um, and, and the mystics have to make shots. You know, they, they've got to come out, have some luck, hit a lot of shots beyond the three point line. Um, and they, they've proven they can do it. Uh, but to me, those are the two biggest keys just for the mystics and having a chance to kind of come out um, and regroup after that first performance against them. Yeah, it's something really interesting. I mean, I'm just going to run down a few stats on you, so don't don't get too uh, too bored from this. But Connecticut Sun leading the league in rebounds. The Mystics are third worst. All right. Now going to points, as we've spoke about, many people don't give enough credit to Washington for their offensive ability. If you're looking, I mean, the Mystics are top half of the league as far as points scored. Obviously, Connecticut's number one. But something that really kind of kind of brought my mind a little bit closer to this game was looking at field goal percentage, all right? Really close. 45 for the Mystics, 47 for Connecticut. Three points. Now, Washington is averaging slightly better with three points made, but percentage-wise, you're talking essentially the same. So they're very even-keeled teams, but the thing that stands out and blows my mind, and I think this is going to be a key and this talks a lot about what you were saying about the multi-headed monster of Connecticut, is Connecticut is averaging 21 assists a game. Want to take a guess what Washington's averaging? Go ahead. 15. (laughs) 15. 15. And and that worries me because Washington's a team that when when they have succeeded, it's been because of good rebounding and spreading the ball and making shots, obviously. but. In this game, if they want to win, they're obviously defense is going to be a, a huge factor. You need to slow down Connecticut. To me, it's kind of like you don't want to get into a shootout with Connecticut because, uh, and, and we saw this with Connecticut going against Minnesota this past week. Um, you, when you have Connecticut, they're such a young and versatile team that's so deep. You know, even if they were in a similar situation to Washington, and they have been in similar situations as far as like condensed schedule, playing a lot of games in a short period. They're young enough and they're deep enough that they don't, you don't see that same kind of tapering off of the speed and the style of play that you see with other teams. Now, I'm not going to call Washington old because there's no, they're no Minnesota and they're no like, you know, one of the older teams in the league, but it's definitely something to keep in mind that like Connecticut's going to be able to run day in and day out. What do you do as a coach to try and slow down Connecticut defensively uh, from the Mystics view? I think. It's a tough one because you're looking at two teams that want to play fast. Now, everyone in the league wants to play fast, but these are probably two of the top teams that that play the way they do. One thing you can do is make shots. You know, if you're making shots, um, if Washington's able to not just be on the arc, but have the ball movement and the spacing and they're being efficient offensively and getting high percentage shots, not just forcing things or or jacking up, you know, fade away 15 footers for 40 minutes. You know, if they're, if they're getting high percentage shots in the paint, um, offensive rebounds, knocking down threes, then you're able to set your defense up at least that's a start. Um, and then the other aspect of it is you know, like, I, like I, I'm going to keep harping on rebounding because to me, that's the biggest key of this game. Um, you know, you have got to keep the sun off the glass. You have to. I mean, if if you want to have a chance in this game, and this isn't just for the Mystics, this is for every team out there in the league, um, controlling the boards and limiting their offensive rebound and, and second chance points. I mean, that's that's a huge stat. Um, so, you know, those those are the two things that I think that you can somewhat control. Um, I mean, you can't always control made shots, but you can control shot selection. And so I think that's, you know, at least a start for the Mystics. Yeah, and I think something that that a lot of people, uh, you know, I was sitting next to Lindsey Gibbs uh, at the at the last Mystics game, and watching, and she pointed a player out to me that 
I honestly, I hadn't even really noticed before. I'll, I'll call myself out on that. Latoya Sanders, you know, 6'3", 170, big body and can handle bigs in this league. And she has versatility. I mean, she's dubbed a forward center. So, you know, she has some flexibility on that. She's lanky. Seeing what she was able to do against Minnesota intrigued me to say, okay, what can she do against a little bit more quick pace big in the league? And I think going up against Connecticut, going up against Shanae and going up against John Quell is going to be a great challenge for her. And the combo of having her and Maisha Hines Allen and, and don't forget about Crystal, you know, the combo of those three underrated how Washington can also play very different styles of basketball when they see fit. Um, I, I mean, I'm just looking at it, and it's something that's really interesting because in my mind, you know, the the top teams in this league need to rebound well. And I'm just going to throw something out there. Connecticut's the number one team as far as rebounds a game. They're averaging 40 rebounds a game. Let me list off three other teams that are considered to be top contenders in this league. All right, we'll start with Washington. They're averaging 30, and they're third to last in rebounds a game. Second to last is Phoenix. All right. And last place for rebounds is the team that a lot of people or as, as you might say, is the consensus number two or the consensus contender right now is the L.A. Sparks. And they're not even averaging 30. You know, so so to me, that's something that uh, such a an important stat, such an important, you know, aspect of the game is being I don't want to say ignored by three contenders. But I mean, what, what does that say to you when I read you those stats? But I think what that says to me, it's a clear, there's a clear emphasis here um, as to teams that have that as part of their identity. That is something that is harped on, that is preached on, that is something that is worked on, you know, every single day in practice. And that is, and that goes just in basketball in general. Rebounding is either a part of what you do or it's not. Um, That is obviously something that the Sun and Kurt Miller and his staff have made a priority in understanding how important that is to their success. Um, Maybe not necessarily having a team with like that alpha dog, as you say, but they've got the tools in place to, to be the best rebounding team in this league. Um, Not to say that, you know, the best rebounding team is going to go on to win the entire thing. You know, that's, that's not always a given. We know that, but there's a direct correlation to what they're doing on the glass right now and where they're at in the league and in the standings. Oh, definitely. I mean, they're getting, I mean, the only team to average double digit offensive rebounds right now is Connecticut. And that, if you don't think that has to do with them also lead leading, lead leading points per game, then let's not talk basketball. Um, Looking at Connecticut though, we're kind of focusing on, on the mystics. there. looking at Connecticut. I'm I'm just going to run through their next few games. So, their last game was on the ninth. They played Minnesota, a big win, 89-75. They move on to then take on, and it's a little bit of a two-game homestay, Mystic's son is tomorrow at 7 or today, depending on when you're listening to this. And then their next game is arguably the number two team in the league, Seattle Storm. A really interesting matchup. And then the next game is Phoenix Mercury. So let, let's recap that. From the ninth to the 16th, they're taking on four teams that are top teams in this league. And, I, and I'll be nice about the links in that one. Um, what, what, I mean, I know it's still early on in the season. It's a short season, so I kind of begrudgingly accept that it's early on in the season. We're a quarter of the way through, so I think every team already has their identities to a certain extent. Now, obviously, you can grow in the season. Um, what are you going to learn specifically about Connecticut as they take on these I don't want to call them juggernauts, but top contenders. Well, I think it's it's interesting to look at. And I, I had made the comment on Twitter uh, maybe last week that said, we're going to learn about a lot about the Connecticut Sun here um, in this next week or week and a half based on just kind of their stretch. And there's an argument out there, you know, where, you know, oh, all right, the Sun started fairly easy right? You know, they, they played kind of the, those lower teams in the league and that, you know, they were able to get out on a hot start early and get some momentum and gain some confidence. And although that might hold some weight, you can't deny the numbers they're putting up, the things that they're doing, um, you know, obviously still playing tough teams. I mean, the, the sky are a tough team, even though they're, you know, um, as up and down as anyone right now, 
the Mystics, a tough team, but they played them when they were extremely down. Um, they've, they've played the fever. They've gone on and um, they played, you know, um, the aces to start the season. And so um, maybe it was a little bit of a, kind of an easier start, if you will. Um, that's not to take anything away from what the Sun are doing. I just feel like, you know, we're going to learn a lot and we're beginning to learn a lot, especially after the Atlanta Dream loss, their lone loss of the season, which, by the way, is interesting because the Dream are third in the league in, in rebounding. Now, that game, you look on the stat sheet, it doesn't necessarily look like they hung in there on the glass, but the reason they were able to even have it close um, and, and, and keep it a game, especially at half, straight out of Nikki Collins' mouth was, was they kept the boards close. You know, they, they gave themselves a chance by, by, you know, remaining close um, on the offensive rebounding, rebounding standpoint and defensive rebounding. And, and they made shots and, and, and the sun were a little bit cold. And so um, with that being their lone, lone loss, you know, they go on to play the Liberty, which is still kind of a wild card right now. We're learning a lot about them. Um, and then the Lynx, which like you said, I mean, they're the links, <laughs> but like you said, you're, you're being nice about that one. And so um, the, whether the, your argument could be strength of schedule or, or whatever it may be, I'm just excited to kind of see these tests moving forward. Um, you know, obviously the Mystics back to maybe a little more 100% is going to be very interesting to me. The, the Seattle Storm are playing at, ex, at an extremely high level right now. Um, I think that's going to be a really fun matchup, two teams that have yet to see each other this year. Um, and then the Mercury, like you said, a veteran team. So we're going to learn a lot about them, um, in terms of just every aspect of the game, but, um, I'm just excited to kind of see what these, this week brings and in, in these next few games, because they're going to be tested, uh, you know, greater than they've been tested so far. Yeah. If you, if you want to beat Connecticut this year, I think it really comes down to rebounding. Minnesota got blown out of the water in the rebound department there. Um, and for me, as much as this mixed this Mystics game is going to be fun and great to watch, the one that I'm most focused on is the Storm. I, I and and as much as I respect the Mercury, I'm like eh about that game because right now what we're seeing is the Storm and the Sun are both playing a very quick pace, a very modern, a very new age style of basketball, at least in this league. Um, and I love it. And and and. I've been on the Sun bandwagon for a couple years now. People were shocked, and I was calling them idiots for being shocked how good they did last year. And now the Storm, who going into last year, many people thought they would make a similar leap or a similar kind of, you know, aha moment, tapered down, you know, let's call it coaching, whatever you want to call it. But now they, I mean, getting Natasha Howard has just been wonderful for them in a, in a very similar sense to, you know, a lot of people were giving me crap. I was hyped and, and very critical of the Storm not taking Azrae Stevens for their draft pick. But what I have seen, and and obviously Jordan Canada has proven me wrong to many extent, but what I have seen is Natasha Howard play that similar type of ball and be used in a similar way that I had hoped to see Azrae be used. So, you know, I, I got a little bit wrong. I might have lost the battle, but I think I won the war. Um so for me, that is going to be such an interesting game. What we've seen, I mean, I'm talking about Storm and the Sun when they've taken on Sparks as kind of, I'd say, the benchmark because the Lynx aren't up there yet. So when, you know, when the Storm took on the Sparks, Natasha Howard was just on point. They were running quick. Brianna Stewart is so underrated in her defensive ability because so often she's she's overshadowed by her abilities on offense and her spreading the balls. So, you know, she might not get the the really amazing flashy stats, but the things that she's doing, you know, I've I've been criticized a lot by by people who follow the league very closely saying that, you know, Jewel Lloyd, early season MVP, Jewel Lloyd, everyone's like, "What are you talking about? Stewie's the one who's doing all the 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 grit and grind to make it and then Jewel is kind of getting the spotlight." And, 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 and there's a, there's a, there's a good, uh, a good thing to be said about that. But in the same respect, I mean, this, if, if you don't have this game circled on your calendar, you don't enjoy good basketball. Oh, you're, you're exactly right with that. I mean, it's going to be an incredible matchup and I, the storm have done kind of exactly what I think I speak for a lot of people, what we've always hoped that they could be doing. Uh, we're talking about an all-star team that just hasn't been able to, um, 
for whatever reason, get it clicking on all cylinders. And like you said, whether that's coaching or the addition of, you know, Jordan Canada, whatever it may be, um, they're, they're, they're clicking right now. Um, and I think that game is going to reveal a lot um, for both teams moving forward. And, and it's going to be a great gauge for us as to kind of where those teams stand. And, you know, look at, looking just at the stats right now, it's, it's, it's interesting. Connecticut Sun leave, lead the league. And I mean, gosh, like half, half, of, half the statistical categories, points per game, rebounds per game, assists per game, field goal percentage. You know, I could just, I could keep going, but if you look on there and just the top five, um, you know, rankings in the league, the storm are right there. You know, they, they are right there in almost every category. They're, they're second in the league in scoring at 88 points a game. The Sun are at 92.6. Um, you know, the Storm are, are at 20 assists a game where the Sun are at 21. So we're looking at just just some really talented basketball right now, and it's going to be a heck of a matchup. I, I genuinely, I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be some great basketball. And then you move on to their next game. And it's funny because as, as much as I've, I might, you know, give criticism to the Mercury, they're a team that just won't die for lack of a better term. You know, uh, DT starts to taper off last year, but they make that great playoff push, got that vet savviness in them. They're a team that stuck around and have gotten a resurgence from Duana Bonner. Um, people don't realize how skilled she was. And I think they too quickly forgot about her when she, she took maternity leave. So for me, I mean, the the Storm game is going to be great, but then they have the next game against the Mercury. It's literally the next day. So, like, th- not only is that going to be a great sign of, okay, you're going up against one team that loves to run it and is playing a similar style ball as you. I do think Connecticut is much deeper than Seattle. Seattle's bench is what Connecticut has. And, and I, I kind of want your take on this, actually, before we move on to Mercury. Um, Connecticut's bench has a core of people that can fill similar roles and have the same flexibility as their starters, as opposed to Seattle's bench has a little bit different of a swag to them and a little little bit different of of a utility belt to them than Connecticut. Um, Could you talk to me a little bit about that and your thoughts on that? You know what? I I don't know that I I agree with you on that. I think, yes, the Sun have incredible depth and they've got a lot of people who are able to come in and play, you know, top minutes. Um, and and that, that, that is a strength to what they do as well. They can go deep um, from the likes of Rachel Bannon, Morgan Tuck, Morgan Tuck, Lexi Brown. I could, I could go down the list. But, you know, if you look at Seattle, you know, you obviously talking about Jordan Canada, who's having a tremendous career. I am all, all aboard. I am driving the Jordan Canada hype train. Trust me. I, I love her to death. I think she's just an incredible young lady and she's going to have a great, great career. But, you know, uh, KML, um, you know, has proven to be able to, you know, play some quality minutes and, and, and score it, you know, really shooting it. She's one of the top shooters in the league right now. Mercedes Russell was a great pickup for them, can come in and um, add some, add a presence in the paint along with Courtney Paris. And so I don't know that I necessarily agree that, that, you know, there's a huge difference in the bench per se. I think that's the sh- a strength of both of these teams is that they have, a strong bench presence, at least from your, your number six, your number seven and your number eight. I'm, I'm going to have to put my tail between my legs and uh, <laughs> respectfully crawl back into my hole. <laughs> but, you know, uh, let's, let's move on to the Mercury real quick before we close out this episode. The Phoenix Mercury, something that I'm going to be interested to see. And I, and I know they pulled off a nice victory against the storm, but what I'm going to be really interested to see is kind of, how Phoenix is able to handle a team with such depth. And we've seen it historically, even when before Bonner took some time off. They struggled because, you know, it, and and this is my personal thing, and this is a whole other episode. I've never fully liked this idea of the rivalry between the Lynx and the Sparks. When it's like, okay, there was two seasons they played in the finals. That's great. I understand it. But if you look historically, I think, Lynx, Mercury are the real rivalry. For many years before they changed the playoff format, it was these two teams battling it out at some point in the playoffs, and everybody knew that whoever won that series was going to go on to the championship and most likely win the championship. It, it, the next, it was honestly, it was almost like, you know, in the NFL, how they do, or I don't know if they still do it. Maybe they, I'm, I'm totally making this up. 
but it was almost like having the Super Bowl and then the All-Star game after the Super Bowl. Like, all right, you already won the hard one. Now go do the fun one and get the accolades and and, and get like the, the, the good times pat on the back. I'm interested to see, to me, depth has been something the Mercury have struggled with. We know they have the stars, BG, DT, Bonner. You know, they bring in January. Um, do you think that this Mercury team has the depth to run with teams like the Storm of the Spar- or the Storm of the Sun? I, I just don't think you can ever count out a team that's got DT and Brittany Griner, you know, Dewana Bonner on it, and, and, and just the greatness that is on that roster in general. Now, do they have the depth? No, you know, no one's going to probably argue about that. But we're talking about, you know, top players on the league that are playing for the Mercury right now, and. Uh, thankfully, we're you know we're seeing Griner at arguably the peak of her career. Um, Diana Tarazi's playing some of the best basketball she's played in her career. Um, so I just don't think you can ever count that out. Um, my concern with them would be long term, um, kind of how the condensed schedule and all of that kind of plays out further down the road. Uh, the Mercury are playing at a really high level right now. You know, I think they're on like what, a five-game winning streak? I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but they're playing on a high w- level right now. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of good things. Um, so I do think that they can withstand, you know, teams like the Storm and uh, the Connecticut Sun. Like I said, it's going to come down to game planning and, and rest and being able to uh, have have some luck, and you're making the shots and you're in your control on the, the boards. But they, uh, they've, got, they've got the tools to do it. There, there's no doubt in my mind. I just, my question would be long term if we're getting into, you know, August and into September, how are the Mercury doing at that point? But I, I, I agree. Dewana Barner for me is the X factor for the make, for the Mercury. Um, not having her last year was just a, a major blow and punch in the gut. And it, and it showed in their play. I had the opportunity to watch them several times when I was in Phoenix. And, um, having her again, I mean, she, she just changes everything. You know, it's like, yeah, she brings so many elements to the game with her versatility and her scoring ability and, uh, defensively, you know, she, she just is like that shot in the arm that they needed. Um, and you can just see it in the way they're playing right now. Yeah. And, and, and to criticize myself, I mean, people talking about the Mercury's bench, Leilani Mitchell, I'm a huge fan of her work. Turner really underrated. I've watched a lot of her overseas ball and, she can ball. I mean, uh, she's only, she's getting like six uh, minutes, you know, the single digits, maybe low double digit minutes typically. Um, But players like that really pique my interest and make me go, oh, wow. I mean, the way she plays. But but back to your Bonner point, I want to get a take from you. Every time I've watched a Mercury game, there's been comments about this. She's coming back. She really hasn't hit her stride yet. Um, you know, she's still adjusting, blah, blah, blah. If this is Bonner adjusting, I do not want to see what happens when she is fully adjusted. She comes in first game back 17, then 12, then 9, then 10, and then she has a three-game streak of scoring 20 or more, all right? And then she tapers down to an 18, 13, and 14. I mean, she's just going hard each game. And I got so pissed off that these games that I keep hearing people talk about her. It's an adjustment period, getting back. And I'm like, she's a pro. She's already back. You, like, if you want to talk about the amazingness of her ability to get back into the game so quickly and with, you know, without missing a step, that's great in my book. But she is just bawling out. And I mean, are we going to have to call her the Slim Reaper? <laughs> that's, a, that's a first. I agree with you. I mean, I... I personally haven't heard that argument about her like kind of getting back into it because to me, I watched the first game and, and, and she killed it. Um, she, 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 it's like she hasn't even skipped a beat. Um, and, and we all know, right. we all know what Dewana Bonner can do. And, and I mean, I'm watching her right now in some of these games, she's doing things. I mean, big time games. She had a stretch there where she was, she was averaging like 22 and a half points a game, um, just like a little over a week ago. And so, um, I don't think I haven't seen her miss her stride whatsoever. Um, I, I I heard she was a little bit nervous coming back and kind of little a little nervous like that first game. But like when that ball got tipped, she was ready to go. Um, she hasn't skipped a beat since, and um, it's 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 exciting to see because you know you can appreciate um, 
coming back from from having twins and just kind of her career, what she's done. But she, she is an incredible player. We, we honestly we don't talk about her enough. Um, yeah, we really At don't. All. We really don't. She, she's a dominant force, and she is not just. Um, uh, she is up there in the ranks of, we're talking about Griner, we're talking about Tarazi, Dewana Barnard, like, like she is right up there with them in terms of the impact she makes on this team. And that's a bold statement, but I stand by it. Oh, I, and I, I'll back that up. If someone let's wants go. to fight about it, let's throw it down. Cause like, look, I mean, let's talk about it. If, if they have Bonner last year, they, I, in my mind, they win at least one game in LA or at least they win one game of that series. It's less of, and I'm not even talking regular season. We're not going to talk about, you know, regular season, because I still don't think she would be enough last year to push them to a one or two seed. Um, but just talking about her a little bit more, I mean, she's statistically having her best year mm-hmm. since 2012. I mean, she's having a prime career resurgence um, that part of me wants to say, maybe the year off was good for her. Maybe the added responsibility of being a parent is good for her. And now she's like, I got to show off for my kids. <laughs> and that very- a little you extra motivation never maybe hurts. A little bit of all the above, you know, having that year and kind of regroup mentally, physically, in different aspects. And you know, whatever it is, it's working for her. So she's just just keep it going. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and and the funniest thing is is with her being gone, and like I've said before, I think a lot of people forgot that she was gone last year. But with her being gone last year, it it lowered Phoenix to this point of. I don't want to call them underdogs. I mean, they were in many respects last year, but under the radar, as in not many people are talking about them. And that's got to be a good feeling for a vet savvy team that knows what, what it takes to win a championship. So I'm, I'm really excited for that game. I'm really excited for Phoenix. I'm somebody who's always, you know, been very critical of Phoenix. And a lot of that has to do with my opinion on, on grinder, not playing the full potential, but like I always say when I bring up that topic, that's another episode. Uh, so make sure to uh, to call us out and get us uh, on a new episode about that. Because no one no one's called me out and said, Arya, you know, for a year you've been saying we're going to do that that Brittany Griner episode. We're going to do that Brittany Griner episode. Uh, so once someone starts calling me out on it, you know, get a little bit of a social media following. Somebody call and him me out. I am ready that. for that topic. Let's go. <laughs> There we go. All right, Rachel, we might we might have to do that after the uh, the Connecticut Phoenix game. Perfect. Maybe we'll just break it down into there. All right, sounds great. Everybody, we want to thank you for tuning in this week. I'm Aria Schwartz, and my co-host, Rachel Galligan. She kills it always. We're the WNBA Insider Show. Different topics, X's and O's, key stats, honest and critical analysis.